Yeah, good morning and afternoon to all of you and a warm welcome to this first official opening press conference on hepatitis at the International Liver Congress 2022, also known as ILC 2022. My name is um, Thomas Burke. I'm the Secretary General of ESL, the European Association for the Study of the Liver Disease or of the Liver, otherwise known as ESL. ESL is, of course, the convener of the ILC. As I mentioned yesterday in, in the opening ceremony, I think I speak for everyone when I say that it's wonderful that we are all here together in person after this interruption of, of the pandemic. And that includes, of course, also the media. Um, you coming from the media, from the press we want to interact with. And I know that press conferences like these are just so much more dynamic in person. So I welcome you all here today. And it goes without saying that we are delighted that we have such a strong media contingent attending this ILC in London. So a warm welcome to those media representatives who are also watching online today. And I'm as equally delighted that we can hold a press conference solely dedicated to hepatitis science. I think the strengths of the abstract you're going to hear from today are indicators that we well entering into a golden age of hepatology science when it comes to viral hepatitis. And of course, the implication of that for the public health are huge. We have several million people worldwide living with viral hepatitis. We have a cure for hepatitis C, but there's no cure for hepatitis B or hepatitis Delta. So today's announcement gives me great hope that we have scientific momentum with us. And of course, despite the fact that hepatitis does affect so many people across the globe, it has not been a health issue that attracts huge media coverage. And of course, it's also we want to change. And I think it has also changed in recent months with the emergence of mysterious acute hepatitis cases in children across Europe and also in the US and uh, all over the world with the highest numbers, but with the highest numbers really here in the UK. And as you know, immediately after this press conference, we will be fortunate to hear from our esteemed colleague, Philippa Easterbrook. She's from the WHO, and she will provide an update on the evolution of children's cases. Philippa will be joined by Professor Maria Buti. Professor Buti is ESL's Chair of Policy and Public Health, left to me. And she will give you um, also a brief update, um, and she will join this press conference later today. So before introducing Maria and my esteemed guests sitting with me here today, let me run through some of the housekeepings. This live press conference is being broadcasted live on the conference platform and will be available on Easel YouTube page shortly after it has ended. Today we'll be hearing brief remarks from all our speakers and then I will open up for questions from our media representatives attending today, both on site but also online. So for all of you attending here in the room, please make your way not to the microphone, but we will hand over a microphone to you that all, also those attending digitally can hear you. Indicate your media outlet, please, and who you would like to direct your question to, and we will then direct the question to the nominated panelist. And all of you, you are watching online, you have to click the join the discussion button and then typing your question, indicate your media outlet and then we will answer your question. And please keep your question brief so that we can cover as many questions as possible. And so if there are no further points, I think we can begin. So first over to you, Maria. 
thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, please stay in the room, those of you that are interested in public health and in viral hepatitis, because we are going uh, to update the cases. There are almost 500 cases in the European Union, children with acute uh, hepatitis, severe uh, uh, hepatitis. Uh, approximately a third of them uh, needed to be admitted at the hospital and even 10% required uh, a liver transplantation. So I think this will be a, a good point for, for discussion. And also we would like to update on, on hepatitis C um, elimination. So those that are really interested in these uh, topics stay at the room. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, many thanks. So I think we can move forward with the first presentation and this presentation will come from Professor Heiner Wiedemeyer. Um, who's the director of the gastroenterology and hepatology department in the medical school Hanover in Germany. And he is really a, a big expert in hepatitis delta, published large international um, trials in hepatitis delta when there was the interferon era. We may still discuss whether interferon might be needed for delta. So please, your abstract. Yeah, thank you, uh, Thomas. Uh, so this uh, afternoon I will uh, have the privilege to present uh, data, primary endpoint data of a phase three trial on hepatitis D. And uh, the hepatitis alphabet, you all know A, B, C, D, E. D is a rare disease. What that D stands for, I'm always quoting D stands for devil because it's definitely the most severe form of chronic viral hepatitis. So these patients have really high risk for developing liver cirrhosis at an early age and also an increased risk for liver cancer. And as Thomas mentioned, until recently we could only um, yeah, provide interferon to some patients that did not work, maybe in 20, 25%, but even uh, the majority of patients could not be treated at all. And this has changed completely in August 2020. The European Medical Agency granted conditional approval to a new drug, and that's an entry inhibitor, uh, blocking the entry of hepatitis B and D particles into the hepatocytes. And this was granted on a very early small phase two trial. And it was amazing. We were really surprised that, that EMA went forward uh, uh, granting approval because there was no alternative available at that time. But obviously it was conditional approval granted on a phase uh, two trial. And this afternoon I have the privilege to present for the very first time, and this is really an almost historic moment for hepatology, that um, a phase three trial on this uh, very severe form of our hepatitis is presented with a new agent. And this phase three trial included 150 patients. The trial was performed in Russia, in Germany, in Sweden, and in Italy. And uh, the, the good message for our patients is that the initial data of the smaller phase two trials were really confirmed. So the drug works. It induces a decline in viral load. And very importantly for us as hepatologists, liver enzymes normalize. Um, this is uh, really good news and also very importantly, the drug is safe. There were no major side effects. Um, it's uh, uh, the drug, the only, let's say, disadvantage is it has to be injected because this is a peptide uh, which requires daily injections, but patients manage very well. They improve liver stiffness. And this is now the rationale, uh, hopefully, that this drug will also receive full official pr approval. Obviously, there are always questions remaining when we do research and science. Uh, the first question is, how long do we have to treat? At this stage, we apply the drug. I will present 48 weeks data. Um, uh, during time, this trial will continue. Treatment will be stopped later on after week uh, 144. So this needs to be answered. The other question is, uh, in previous times, Thomas mentioned, we used interferon. Now I have the old interferon, the new drug bulivertide. Can we combine it? Yes or no? This is also something to be addressed. Um, what is important here also, as this drug has already received conditional approval two years ago, we have already some real-world data 
in parallel to this phase three trial, which I'm presenting, which is also presented during this meeting. So for us in the hepatitis D field, is really exciting times, completely novel data, and game-changing for patients. Yeah, thank you, Heine. Um, really exciting data, and great that they could be presented here today. So our next speaker is Manish Tapar. Manish Tapar is Associate Professor of Medicine at the Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia in the United States. And he will talk to some equally exciting results of a phase three trial of Givaziran in patients with acute hepatic porphyria. So what it's about hepatic, acute hepatic porphyria, please. Uh, hi, good morning, thank you for having me here today. So uh, as you're probably aware, acute hepatic porphyria, is a, it's a rare genetic disorder. It causes uh, uh, acute neurovisceral symptoms, which can be life-threatening in a small proportion of patients. It can also lead to chronic dis de de debilitating symptoms in, sub in, in a subgroup of patients. And there are four subtypes of acute hepatic porphyria, with AIP being most common. Now, in this meeting, we're presenting data from a long-term study called, from the Envision study, uh, which was a random, uh, randomized placebo double-blind study uh, over 36 months of a novel treatment called uh, gibosaran, um, which has been approved and is commercially available. But what we're looking at uh, in, in the study is, is that how the efficacy of this medication is maintained over 36 months. Because there were some concerns, because this is a novel agent, how it's injected on a monthly basis, it's siRNA-based. And it leads to sustained reduction in the annualized attack rates in, in the subgroup of patients both who started out on the study drug initially and also in the subgroup of patients who switched over from the placebo arm. Um, uh, in, the, in the subgroup specifically, they switched over from the placebo to the givoseran arm. The annualized attack rates uh, did decrease from 10 to 0.87. So this does have uh, a potential to alter the course of this disease. Uh, and uh, what we're showing is long-term safety. Uh, this uh, correlates with improved quality of life in these patients and also improved ALA and PBG, which are just markers of uh, disease activity. Uh, the, the medication was uh, definitely very well tolerated, uh, all things given. Uh, some most common side effects were injection site reactions, fatigue, and nausea. Uh, liver enzyme elevations and renal function were elevated uh, in about 19 to 22%, but overall there were no drug discontinuation. Uh, I, I think it's important because it, it just proves the efficacy of this novel treatment, which does have a potential to alter uh, a patient's uh, life, uh, course of the disease in these patients. Thank you. Yeah, Manish, thank you very much. So our next speaker is Professor Kosh Agarwal, and he's a consultant hepatologist and transplant physician at the Institute of Liver Studies based here in London at the King's, Co King's College Hospital. So please, Kosh, over to you. So thank you, Thomas, uh, and thank you to Easel. Um, I have a slightly different kind of conversation with you today. I'm going to talk about hepatitis B. Uh, again, it's important uh, for Maria and Thomas and Easel that we think about public health and global viruses and liver disease. And hepatitis B is a globally relevant virus. So the, la the latest estimates um, suggest almost 300 million people in the world affected with hepatitis B. And almost every 30 seconds, someone dies of hepatitis B somewhere in the world. So previously a fairly silent disease, but a pandemic, and a disease that we have good treatments that can control the hepatitis B, but we do not have treatments that cure hepatitis B. On the back of the stunning success of hepatitis C, there is within the field and the community a wish to try and achieve cure of hepatitis B. And we characterize that by losing surface antigen, a marker of hepatitis B. And Heiner's already told you that a, a coexisting virus, Delta, the devil virus, is, comes along with hepatitis B. So the study that I'm privileged to present on behalf of my co-authors is a study that we presented tomorrow, and that's called the REEF2 study. And that's a European-based study looking at two new antiviral agents in combination in a very tight 
cohort of hepatitis B patients who do not have cirrhosis and who are already on the standard treatment that they are normally getting in clinical care, so they're suppressed. And this is the first study that shows a combination in a phase two study, 130 patients randomized two to one into active and normal control therapy. The unique aspect of this study is that after 48 weeks, all treatment was stopped. So the, if you want to get to a cure, you have to think about a finite duration of therapy. And currently we don't have that, so we really want to try and provide better treatments for our patients. And I'll be presenting 24 weeks of follow-up, so six months of follow-up. So the headline data to try and um, kind of move things along is that after 24 weeks of follow-up, no patients in this study lost their surface antigen, i.e. were cured of the hepatitis B in the active arm or in the control arm. And that's really important for the field. However, there is evidence, and I'll present this tomorrow, to show that certainly the combination of these drugs and one particular aspect, the siRNA, um, shows a significant decrease in some of the markers that were interested in hepatitis B. And at the end of treatment, 30% um, of the patients were undetectable and also had a very low surface antigen level. And this is at 24 weeks. So we didn't achieve a cure, but at the end of follow-up, uh, a significant proportion of patients were, and I'm putting this in inverted commas, in a controlled virological state. Is that good enough? Is that going to be um, followed through when we report 48 weeks? What does this mean for the field is, is really important for the discussion, um, but this is a really important study. Um, I really have to highlight that this was uh, fulfilled and delivered in the COVID era. So a lot of uh, patients were looked after very carefully by sites in Europe. And this will take us back to the drawing board to think about whether we need better antiviral treatments or whether we need to think about different combinations um, and whether actually stopping treatment it, with all treatment is the right um, strategy to take. By and large, the therapy, active therapy was well tolerated, but I do have to note, and it's published in J Hepatology this month, that one subject in the control arm, not the active treatment arm, when we stopped all treatment, um, flared their hepatitis B, that was my patient, and they required liver transplantation. So how we go forward to design these studies, how we define cure for hepatitis B, and what are the components of new treatments to try and get to this idea of cure are questions that we will take away with our colleagues, with the scientists, with our clinician colleagues, with the patients to move forward. So this is not an endpoint and an answer, but has quite good outcomes if control, um, but pr probably poses more questions, but will be very informative for the community. And we're grateful for Easel giving us this platform to present it. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Kosh. So um, we come to the discussion later, as I mentioned. So our next speaker is Professor Bashar Akal, and he's Professor of Medicine and Director of the Liver Transplant a clinic at the Mayo Clinic um, College of Medicine, Gastroenterology, Hepatology in Phoenix, United States. Please. Uh, thank you, Thomas. <clears throat> and thank you. Uh, I would like to thank ESOL as well for allowing us to share the results of uh, our study. So I'm switching gears here, and I will be talking about hepatitis C donors that are directed to people who need a transplant and who don't have hepatitis C. Now, some of you may ask why we are doing this. I mean, the dynamics that are happening in the U.S. and most likely in, the, in, Western, in, in European countries as well, that in the U.S. we are dealing with the opioid epidemic, which means that the number of donors with hepatitis C continues to increase. Now, fast forward with the effective therapy that we have currently for hepatitis C, very few people on the transplant list, whether it's liver or non-liver transplant list, having hepatitis C, and thus there's nobody that can utilize those organs. So in the presence of a highly effective therapy, the transplant community has been exploring venues in order to expand the donor pool. Despite record number of transplant, the demand for transplant continues to be high. So with that in mind, our group has been really pursuing some innovative treatment options 
in people who get an organ from somebody with hepatitis C, how can we prevent that infection? Now, the standard of care, most of us have been used to in transplant center, that those organs are located to somebody on the transplant list. Universally, they become viremic, meaning they will have the hepatitis C infection. You start the treatment after the transplant, and usually you will treat them for up to 12 weeks in order to achieve eradication. We kind of like decided to explore the venue of preventing the hepatitis C infection. So with the, we took it, that into account. We learned from the experience, the Canadian experience, and we decided to combine two drugs. One of them is called Legapravir Bebrentesvir, or which is an antiviral therapy that's available to treat hepatitis C. It treats all genotypes. And we combine that with a very unique lipid-lowering agent. It's called ezetimibe. This is a lipid-lowering agent that has the unique feature of blocking the receptor that is used by the hepatitis C for cell entry. We thought that the combination of those two medications, hopefully, will be effective in preventing hepatitis C in somebody who receives an organ from a donor infected with that virus. So we combined those two medications. We started those medications before we go to surgery, and we only applied that for non-liver solid organ transplantation. Why not liver? Because the liver is the reservoir for hepatitis C. So phase one, we decided to go to non-liver solid organ transplant, meaning kidney transplant, heart transplant, lung transplant, as well as a combination of those. So we started the medications before going to surgery, and we only treated for seven days after, eight days, eight days of therapy only. We were extremely surprised and happy to see that the results were impressive. With eight days course, and after enrolling so far 38 patients, including a combination of kidney transplant, kidney pancreas, as well as heart transplant, we have been, if, we have been able to prevent chronic hepatitis C in 100% of those patients. So with that in mind, we feel that this will allow us to use those organs more frequently, will encourage a lot of centers to use those organs, especially with the high demand, you are treating the patients with only eight days therapy compared to 12, which means the cost effectiveness will be impressive as well. So very happy to uh, report those results and uh, hopefully we can build on that success so that this becomes the standard approach whenever those organs are used. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think really very much revealing what can be achieved if there are effective antivirals around and what far-reaching consequences this may have. So uh, now our final speaker is Beatrice uh, Emanuel. She's a lead analyst hepatitis C elimination, specialized commissioning at NHS England and NHS Improvement in the UK, correct? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, Beatrice, please. Thank you, Isel, for this opportunity to talk about the HIT program in England and to present uh, new data about treating hepatitis C in prisons. Please permit me to uh, start by introducing uh, Sean Cox in the audience, who is um, my co-author and co-presenter, and who is the director of Prisons of the Hepatitis C Trust and a mastermind behind the HIT program. So he can uh, also take questions um, alongside me. Um, so I'm going to start by giving a brief overview of the um, of the. Um, of the background of this project. So uh, the NHS um, Hepatitis C Elimination Program is working towards a shared goal of um, eliminating uh, hepatitis C um, as a um, public health uh, issue, major public health issue in England, ahead of the WHO goal um, of 2030. So this program involves a close collaboration between NHS England, uh, the Hepatitis C Trust, and three big pharmaceutical companies. And we all work together very closely and, um, and run many initiatives, elimination initiatives, to find potential, um, potential patients, test for infection, and treat everyone who needs it. Um, prison populations are known um, to have a higher rate of people who are actually living um, with um, a hepatitis C infection compared to the general public. And so they are believed to be um, one of the main reservoirs of infection that we need to be accessing at the elimination program. Um, so we have already um, rolled out a very extensive um, opt-out testing in prison receptions where we test for all BBVs, including hepatitis C. And um, however, this measurement 
is uh, applies only to new entrants in prison. So um, whilst the, a lot of prisons are actually regularly and consistently test the, the static population that are already resident in prisons, um, some of them don't do it so uh, consistently. And this is why we decided to um, boost the elimination program. Um, and um, we um, and, for, and and with the support of the Hepatitis C uh, Trust and their peers, who are people uh, with incredible lived experience and capacity, and uh, the, our pharmaceutical partners, we have rolled out this high-intensity test and treat program uh, um, and projects across all England. So these hits offer a test to every single person in prison and. Um, and screen the majority of all prison residents over a few days and rapidly initiate treatment to those who need it. As a result, after undertaking a hit, a whole prison can, um, can be cured of the virus, thus enabling a microelimination in that state. Uh, to date, almost 30,000 people um, have been tested, and that um, um, corresponds to 40% of, um, of the prisons in the entire country. Uh, a breakdown um, um, between the prisons shows that 35% uh, of male uh, prisons have been uh, targeted, and 83% of all female prisons um, have been uh, targeted. And we only have two female prisons left in the country to target. Um, so here, uh, what we are presenting here is an audit of the first three years of the uh, HIT program, which despite the pandemic has been successful in testing 90% um, of, of the prison population in, in these prisons and getting 93% of all residents with chronic hepatitis C access to curative treatment. Our data suggests that there are some subtle but significant differences between female and male prisons. So uh, this, uh, for instance, in terms of the uptake of the testing and uh, the presence of uh, antibodies for hepatitis C and the prevalence are all uh, higher in female prisons compared to male ones. Our data also suggests that um, the testing uptake was also higher in uh, closed category C prisons compared um, to uh, more open category D prisons where uh, male uh, prisoners can actually go out during the day and during the heat times to uh, perform, um, you know, like to work in the community. Um, moreover, um, we've also found that the prevalence was higher in female closed prisons uh, compared to open ones. And in fact, it was the highest uh, we found um, across the country. And we also found that uh, the prevalence was higher in um, male uh, remand prisons, which is um, uh, uh, where the prisoners uh, go to be um, wait awaiting sentencing or awaiting a relocation. It's a more chaotic population going in and out compared to uh, settlement prisons where, um, where people are more settled and therefore uh, more static. Um, overall, we set up a model which has allowed us to get into prisons and get people treated. And we think we are well on course to ultimately um, eradicate, um, eliminate hepatitis C in prisons. We have almost cleared all female prisons and we're well on our way to um, um, eliminating hepatitis C in male prisons as well. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very <laughs> much. Yeah, thanks a lot to all our experts here and that you spent time sharing your thoughts with our media specialists and, and press representatives. So are there questions coming from the floor? We have some here coming online. Um, yes, please. Hi, um, Kate Berba from Helio. I was wondering if uh, we could go down the line and just in your own words describe how your results may inform patient care going forward. Yeah. Oh, um, if, if anybody, if we could go down the line real quick, if that's okay? Yeah. Well, we perhaps I, I can bring your, your question a bit into context, um, perhaps starting with you, Heiner, with the hepatitis delta. So if a patient with hepatitis delta entering our outpatient clinic, um, so far, I think we foresee a history that we don't know when, but very, very likely he will end up with a liver transplantation or he will die due to liver cancer, and we have really nothing to offer, right? So it's the first time, really, that the patients have an antiviral treatment. It gives so much hope to patients, which we never had before, and uh, this is just spectacular. So patients were lining up, they are so excited, and they're, they're afraid of dying, and now they have a hope. And the caveat or the uncertainty is now well you have mentioned that we have to give it subcutaneously daily we do not know it works as long as we give it or is there resistance or so also there's a post on saturday there's no resistance it does not 
let's say, lead to complete response in every single patient. So there's some work to do, but for the far majority, it really works. Yes, it's a daily injection, but I can tell you from my experience, people don't care. If uh, a daily injection to save your life, they take it. <laughs> and perhaps the question to you, Manish. So with the acute porphyria, so what are the patients suffering from mainly and how does it change their life, their quality of life, and what about, let's say, long-term risk also in unfavorable outcome? What are these patients suffering after 10 years or 20 years? Is it just the pain attacks or... So, 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 so the, th thank you for the question. I think it's a very relevant question because it, it brings our focus back to the patients where it should be, right? <clears throat> so, you know, patients can present with acute neurovisceral attacks, which can be life-threatening, and uh, the, 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 the givoseran is available commercially both in Europe and, and in the U.S., and it has certainly changed the, uh, how patients are treated and managed. Now, th this particular paper addresses the long-term safety and efficacy of this medication, which is a novel agent and which has been used, you know, SRNA-based therapy is used, and you're going to see more of that. So uh, over three, three years, the efficacy is maintained. There were a lot of concerns raised initially about how it's going to perform. Is there going to be antibodies developing and things like that? So that has not panned out. So... Uh, what we've shown is that it does improve the patient's overall quality of life. Their attack rates are down by 90% approximately, uh, and uh, uh, they continue to perform well socially and allowing them to lead yeah. normal lives, you know. And uh, yeah. long-term consequences... really elaborate a bit more. What is the normal life of a patient that had these severe attacks? How often, what does it mean for for their life and the behavior and occupation and all these so things. so so the 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 long term uh complications are, are is 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 variable okay uh, and uh, i'm going to answer a loaded question here but that's okay uh, uh majority of patients will have one attack and they will never have another one but there's a small subset of patients who keep on having these frequent recurrent attacks we do know that those are the patients those are targeted in this study uh, also, long term, we don't know that these patients have a much higher risk for uh, liver cancer or hepatocellular cancer, somewhere seven to ten times the baseline population. So we don't have data about that because this is only a three-year study. But the hope is if you can lower the levels of these uh, uh, ALA and PBG, you can lower the risk of uh, liver cancer, and that you know that's going to not happen in the study. Uh, and it does improve their quality of life and their functioning, basically. Okay, I think, and then we come to the third treatment, perhaps you you refer to, and this was hepatitis B treatment, what it really means. So you mentioned, Koch, these patients are under controlled situation in terms of that we blocked the replication that means that, that means that we will not find any more virus, at least not only tiny amounts in the blood. But if we stop, it comes immediately back. That's the issue. And what does the new treatment then bring to the patient? Yeah, so <clears throat> thank you for the question. It's a good, an important question. We have very good therapies right now for hepatitis B. We need therapies, as we see in hepatitis C, that cure. Long-term treatments can be taken but may have some side effects over a long period of time. We have actually a poster from King's talking to our patients who are very keen to move towards cure treatments and cure for hepatitis B. And you've heard you know, the benefits of having a cure for a virus, and we, with our patients, are very keen to aspire to that. Our trial really doesn't give a clear answer for our patients. It shows that with this first combination of the most established antivirals, that this combination doesn't get to this cure where we lose the marker of hepatitis B. But underneath that, a significant proportion of these patients now drop an important marker, the surface antigen, and actually in the follow-up phase of 24 weeks, about a third of these patients were in a, were in a controlled virological state. So that may potentially be termed a partial cure. Really important to say that's very early data, and this is our first reporting of this. And it's also important to say, with the idea of stopping treatment, all treatments, there potentially is this risk of a flare, and, and that is why I made time to highlight that. So there may be a different kind of terminology of control, but there may be risks. We need to do much more work with our patients. Yeah, 
<clears throat> I think this answers your question. There's a next question over there. My name is Martina Lenzen Schulte from Germany, and I have a question to Professor Aquell. Are these results published or presented here for the first time? This is the first question, and the next is, uh, does the uh, treatment affect the result of the transplantation in a way? Excellent question, and thank you for the question. Uh, okay. In regard first to the first part, is it published or not? The manuscript is currently under review, so this is something I can share with you, and uh, we will um, I, I, most likely I will not be able to share with you the name of the journal that's currently been reviewing that. But it is uh, being it's already been submitted for publication. The second part, did it affect the outcome of transplant? And the answer for that, absolutely not. The graft, which is the survival of the organ and the patient's survival, was totally unaffected by the use of those medications. And that's the reason because of two main advantages. First, we are using the treatment for only seven days compared to the standard therapy, which was 12 weeks. And second is because you are eliminating the presence of virus post-transplantation, we have not dealt with any of the complications that happens with hepatitis C in the setting of an immune suppressed status. So those were great advantages that we have seen. The third advantage that I'll share with you, which was extremely important, a patient who agrees to accept an organ from somebody with hepatitis C tend to wait on the list much shorter than somebody who does not agree to accept those organs. So think about it, the dynamic will favor the use of those organs because transplant centers and patients are reluctant to accept those organs currently. They are worried about the treatment, the duration, the cost and complications. We are eliminating all those barriers. We hope our research will open the door so that more of those organs can be used. Yeah, and you know that the data will be presented there as an abstract and this is a citable resource to be used, so you don't have to wait um, for the full published manuscript to, to refer to these new findings. Yeah, yeah. yeah. over um, there, sorry. Yeah. Claudia Czabuschnik from Austria uh, to Dr. Weidemeyer. Can you give an estimation about the cost of the treatment because this plays a huge role in the duration? And can you give some insights on the methodology like probability and confidence index, please? So regarding cost, this is country specific. Obviously, each country has its own system, and this has been discussed in every disease uh, overall, and uh, therefore I cannot give one distinct price. Um, that's uh, the point. It's an orphan disease, so it's a high price, is what I can say. But um, overall, uh, in the long term, uh, it's uh, very likely to be uh, also cost efficient because you, you save an enormous amount of additional costs in the long term for these patients. And the second question was, sorry. Uh, on the yeah, so the, the um, let's say the, the absolute numbers, uh, you, I will show a little later in the presentation. You can see the presentation where I give the exact numbers and we can forward this to you immediately and I don't have to give numbers right now. Yeah, are there further questions here from the audience? There are some questions coming here from the, from the platform, a bit about um, whether we can cure with bulivertide, so in the Delta, uh, longer experimental treatment to cause cure, and this is perhaps too cautious, so should we extend the experimental treatment to have a higher percentage of achieving these functional or these partial response? That's a very good cure? question. Uh, yeah. In the world of hepatitis B, um, there are still multiple unknowns. Um, this is the first study to show a combination, a phase 2B study, um, and, and also with stopping treatment. Um, so the potential way forward is to try different combinations or different types of drugs or different duration and perhaps a longer duration. So that's a good comment. Um, for me, for this study, you, it has not achieved its endpoint of curing patients with hepatitis B. And to use the aphorism of Samuel Beckett, we just need to continue to fail better in our work in hepatitis B. But this is still got quite a lot of positives to aid the community. With the, can we cure?
cure with bulimatide? This is perhaps a simple question here. The short answer, I don't know. <laughs> uh, this is quite clear. So there is some evidence from single cases that we may stop treatment and that the virus does not come back. But I would expect at this stage um, that uh, the treatment is coming back. For the patient, the most important message is don't stop on your own. I think because we don't know, it's a risk, yes. This will be answered. This is our job to answer. Um, for patients with advanced disease, I consider this as a rather maintenance treatment um, and uh, everything else to be answered. A final question perhaps um, to you, Beatrice, um, with these elimination in, in prisons. I think it's really very remarkable results. And could you model or is there an estimate what this means? You know, if you have this kind of micro-elimination in, in, in prisons, how will this affect the, also to reach a WHO goal that we reduce the incidence of hepatitis C new infections to only 10%, so you reduce it more than 90%. Do you think this could be really a very important, or are there models really to, to show this? Yes, that's a, that's a very good question. So. Um, so the current prevalence that we, the baseline prevalence that we saw in prisons one, was 1.7%. 1 and so we know that there is a, a sort of combination of, of, of people and, and that the, um, they are at higher risk than the general public. But we, what we need to do is untangle the different factors uh, that come in and affect the risk within prisons. Uh, we also know that um, what we are trying to do is build in models, in fact, um, we're currently um, trying to build in models that um, include prisons in, in, uh, in predicting the community um, prevalence and incidence. So um, I think, I, think um, I don't know whether I'm answering the questions, uh, but, uh, but uh, I think it's a very important, um, these data are very important. Um, first of all, because um, People, the reinfections is another, uh, is another important side to this. And that actually reflects the incidence in, uh, in community. Yeah. So because it's most likely that those patients who once enter the hospital, either they get infected there or they will then transmit, right, prison. to people. Prison. prison. Oh, sorry, in prison. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was what what did I say? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you know, I'm not working so often in, in prison. <laughs> sorry. I'm, I'm totally hospital-based. Yeah, but I think <laughs> perhaps it's all time we have, you know, but thanks a lot. You will get all the information. You can get the PowerPoint presentation. If you need anything, please read out, uh, reach out to, to Michael Kessler. I really would like to thank you for your interest here. You can also approach individually the experts um, being here together with me. I would like to thank you all, first of all, for your incredible good work. Congratulations that you have high level been selected um, during this ILC 2022. And I wish you uh, a nice Congress and a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you.